Hello and welcome to this Eaglet Eye Direct Connect uh, webinar. And it is our pleasure to have the focus today on, with uh, Aculens on the Maxim 3D and the connection with the iSurface Profiler. My name is Arnie Snapfangers and I'm CEO of, uh, of Eaglet Eye and it's, it's absolutely my pleasure to, uh, to, to give this introduction and to introduce to speakers uh, here tonight in this webinar. Uh, first is uh, Dr. Alex Gibberman. Uh, Dr. Gibberman, uh, together with uh, Dr. David Williams in, in 2020, actually started together 2020 Eye Care in Loveland, Ohio. And before that, he was uh, six year in private practice. Uh, Dr. Gibberman is a, a fellow of the Skiro Lens Education Society and also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. And he has a very strong track record in, uh, in fitting uh, specialty and Skiro lenses. And it's absolutely uh, uh, a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to have him as, uh, as our uh, main, uh, main guest here uh, this, uh, this webinar. And then from Aculens, uh, we'll be joined by Troy Miller. And Troy Miller is VP of Operations of Aculens and, uh, and, uh, and an absolute uh, uh, fitting specialist. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him here as well. Um, let me uh, start um, this webinar by a quick introduction into the transformation of scleral lens fitting that is, is currently happening. And, uh, and one of uh, the great ways to actually illustrate that or to, to, to see that is in the enormous uptick of, uh, of publications on ocular shape, and particularly, of course, on scleral shape. And that's been, been driven by profilometry devices such as the, the eye surface profiler. And, um, and I can tell you there's still a lot more to, uh, to discover, to describe, and so you will um, see a lot more publications coming. But uh, what we have learned already now is that uh, compared to the cornea, the sclera is much more asymmetric, and uh, there's much more irregularity in the shape of the sclera. And, and also a very clear point that comes out of the, of the publications is that you cannot predict from the shape of the cornea, you cannot extrapolate onto the sclera to, uh, to predict the shape of that sclera. And so when you're fitting a scleral, of course, it's very important that you actually measure the sclera in order to get accurate data. And the eye surface profiler uh, is, is based on, on profilometry. And so it measures the full cornea limbus to limbus every time, and then also a large part of the sclera. And, and, and with that 3D data of the ocular surface, you take away the guesswork of specialty contact lens fitting. And the iSurface Profiler is a single shot device. So it's very fast to, uh, to take a measurement of the eye. And it does uh, so at high accuracy for the cornea, it's two micron and for the sclera, it's 10 micron. And there's about half a million data points. And it's also a, a full topographer with all the corneal maps and parameters that you would get from your normal topographer. The technology is called, as, as, as I mentioned, is called profilometry. And uh, the secret sauce is a fluorescein that you instill on the tear film. And then we project, or the device projects from two sides, uh, a vertical line pattern on the eye. And it, it does so in, in milliseconds after each other. And, um, and those photos then are uh, processed into 3D uh, height data. And you see here a number of these, these maps that, that could come out uh, of, of, of a measurement of an eye. And, and, and so you will be able to see the exact shape of the, of the cornea, but also of the sclera. It's a symmetry and, uh, and any kind of uh, protrusions or lesions such as a pinguicula, you will be able to, uh, to detect and measure um, so that uh, when you're fitting a scleral lens, you'll be able to, uh, to really uh, uh, get all the detail that you need to prevent a lot of refits. 
The iSurface Profiler uh, has a very strong philosophy of an open platform. We want you, the practitioner, to have freedom of choice to work with the lab that you're most comfortable working with. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you see the Maxim 3D from Oculens here, one of our uh, strong partners. And we're, we're so delighted that we can focus here today on, uh, on, on this connection. And the Direct Connect, basically, what is that? It is a, is a smart way that after you've taken the measurement of an eye, you can push the 3D uh, measurement out to uh, the Oculens team. Um, and, uh, and then they will actually see the same 3D data as, as you have measured. And in consultation, you will be able to have a very informed decisions on both sides. In a nutshell, so the eye surface profiler is focused on all specialty lenses, whether it's, it's soft, it's RGP, or it's, it's hybrid or, or scleral, of course. And um, the device and the technology has, uh, has, has created or generated, has developed a number of first lens fit algorithms. Uh, it's an open platform, so you're in, always in control. And uh, we have developed an online e-learning academy that is a very useful, easy to use tool to ramp up your knowledge of taking great measurements with the iSurface Profiler. So in the shortest amount of time, you will be able to, uh, to uh, measure proficiently um, and, and therefore uh, get great results with uh, the fitting the Maxim 3D. And that is a nice bridge to hand over to, uh, to the other side, to, uh, to Dr. Giberman. Awesome, thanks Arnie. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen here and let's make sure we can see it. Are we in business? Yep, all good. Awesome. All right, so yeah, I have um, just a little bit of background uh, for me. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with AccuLens probably now for the past seven years or so. Um, and I think I started using the iSurface Profiler um, about four years ago. And uh, man, have we come a long way. And, and I, will, I will give a lot of credit to AccuLens uh, for really getting me going. Seven years ago, I had not so much as touched a scleral contact lens. We really didn't do a whole lot of it in school at that point. Um, and they were awesome enough to fly someone out to my office at the time and pretty much, uh, you know, gave me the crash course and, and taught me what was what. And, um, you know, here we are fast forward seven years later. And in my new practice, we're averaging right around 16 to 17 scleral fits a month. So uh, it's been, they're just an awesome company to, uh, to work with across the board. So big thank you to those guys for that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to really kind of talk about how we utilize um, the, the iSurface Profiler and AccuLens in our office and how nicely I feel like the two really work together. Um, so as Arnie mentioned, uh, it really starts with image acquisition. And I don't think that I can um, overstate this enough that the, the data is only as good as the image that you're taking and sending to the lab. So, you know, if you're sending them, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, so just to, to kind of expand on what Arnie was saying about how to acquire a really good image, what we found works really well is uh, a, a couple things. So when the patient first comes in, we, we use a drop of preparacaine in, in both eyes. Um, and then the second step is we'll use a blink gel tear. Um, so we'll put a blink gel tear in each eye and then we'll kind of focus on one eye at a time. So using the fluorescein strip, we'll put another gel tear um, on the fluorescein strip and totally, um, you know, paint the eye, so to speak. Um, I think the second pearl here is that it's very tempting uh, to try and do this by yourself to kind of reach around and hold the patient's lids. You get such better results when you have two people doing it, whether it's just two staff members or whether it's yourself and a staff member. 
And if you're new to using the iSurface profiler, I really encourage you to be involved for the first however many, just so you get a really good feel for it. Um, but it's much easier, I think, for, for me, if I'm doing it, to hold the lower lid and have my staff member hold the uh, upper lid of the patient while you're looking at the screen so you can really see what you're doing and you're making sure that you're not really pushing on the, the eye anywhere. So that's really, really important. Um, kind of the second piece to that is taking three images for each eye and then you're selecting the best one uh, overall to you. So you, you really want to take three images of the right, three images of the left um, so that you have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of different images to choose from. Um, also encouraging the patient to blink in between because you don't want that eye to get dry. Um, the other piece is if the patient is a current contact lens user, and not even just for scleral lenses, but even if they're wearing soft lenses or hard lenses, um, if you can train your staff to ask the patients when they call in to make the appointment, um, ideally you want that patient at an absolute minimum to be out of their lenses for at least 24 hours. And really ideally you, you want them to be out of them for about two days. Um, because otherwise you're gonna end up with a compression ring and that's also gonna skew the data because that indentation from the contact that they're wearing will show up when you, when you take the image um, and you don't want that to skew your data. So it's, it's um, you know, sometimes this is difficult if you have a patient that's an advanced cone in both eyes, um, you know, the idea that they're gonna be going without a lens in either eye uh, is not good. So in, their, in those circumstances, um, the best thing you can do is have them uh, remove one lens and, and maybe you're doing one eye one week and then you have them come back the following week to do the other eye. So that can be uh, kind of a workaround for that. So once you have your, your images, um, I, this is an actual uh, patient of mine um, that we saw about a week ago um, and I just kind of wanted to quickly take you through um, some of the stuff that we're uh, looking at here. Um, and then the process of also how to submit that to, to AccuLens. Um, so for this particular patient, um, she was a 66-year-old female who was referred to us uh, because actually the cornea specialist couldn't correct her to 2020 didn't have a terrific reason for it. She had some mild cataracts, but it wasn't really um, significant enough to do surgery. So she wanted us to kind of do a diagnostic fit. Um, and, and apparently on the topography, there was a little bit of irregular astigmatism, although it wasn't keratoconus. Um, so, you know, kind of fast forward, uh, we were actually able to get her to 2020 with sclerals. And so the patient decided to go forward with it. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to use it as an example is because, um, you know, even though her, her corneas aren't super interesting, um, this is the bisphere elevation map. And this is kind of your, your home screen. It kind of tells you uh, a lot of different data. So this kind of inner circle represent, this is your, the cornea. And then this kind of outer zone here is your sclera. And you kind of think of the colors, um, if we kind of think of the, this is a best fitted sphere. So if we're kind of, you know, using the, the arc of the eye or the arc of the lens, the blues um, are basically the lowest points and the oranges and the reds are the highest points. And you can actually rotate this meridian around and kind of see what it looks like. And so in, in this patient's case, she had a very uh, oblique, uh, scleral um, profile, very oblique toricity. So, you know, so many patients are, um, you know, with the rule, against the rule. And, and for her, it was uh, almost perfectly toric in an oblique meridian. So I thought it was a good example to kind of demonstrate what the uh, AccuLens Maxim 3D could do. And I'll have uh, Troy kind of show you that in a minute. Um, so again, real quickly, just to go through some of this data, um, you can, the cord length represents essentially the size of the, the scleral that you're working with. And in AccuLens' case, in their trial set, they have a 15.9 millimeter lens, and they also have a 
four millimeter lens. And a real kind of a, a quick way to decide which lens you want to use is just by using the HVID in general. And this is not a, a you know, a super um, hard rule that we stay with, but if the HVID is, is significantly above 12 millimeters, we're going to go with the 16-4 lens. And if it's less than 12 millimeters in the HVID, we're going to go with the 15.9. And also keep in mind that's just in the AccuLens trial set, but their diameters are totally customizable. So that that's not necessarily the, the final diameter. You can you can ask for that to be bigger or smaller, but that's just kind of what we use as a, a jumping off point. So uh, just for the example's sake, if we're using a 15.9, it's gonna tell us um, the, the absolute minimum and maximum uh, sagittal depth. Uh, the, the min and max sag at 90 degrees kind of tells you um, the two principal meridians 90 degrees away from one another, uh, where that can be in general helpful is to help you kind of the practitioner understand if you're going to need a spherical lens or if you're going to need a lens with a toric periphery. Um, in this case, we've got about a 500 micron difference, so quite a bit uh, of difference in sagittal depth between the two principal meridians. So at the very least, we're, we're probably gonna use a, uh, a toric peripheral curve for this patient. Um, and then looking at the temporal nasal sag over here, um, again, that's going to change as we kind of rotate this around. All you have to do is kind of click and re-click the, uh, the checkbox. And that will just tell you kind of the difference, um, you know, horizontally in the meridian that you've selected on the nasal versus the temporal side. And that can help to predict um, decentration along with um, the need for maybe either a freeform or a quadrant specific lens. So that's really more or less just for your information and so that you can kind of, you know, see what's going on with the eye. This kind of just, you know, by looking at this map, I get a good idea of, you know, if I'm going to put a trial set lens on the patient, I already kind of know what it's going to look like, right? I mean, if, if we look at, uh, you know, over in these big blue areas, if we put a spherical lens on and the eye is significantly lower in those areas, um, those edges are probably going to look pretty flat. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of helpful to keep in mind. So, you know, I think that the temptation a, a little bit is, you know, we get this idea of, you know, well, now we have these magnificent scans, we have all this data, why not just submit it right to the lab? Why do we even need to put a scleral on the patient? And, um, you know, as opposed to just doing it empirically, wouldn't that save us time? And, and I think the answer is no. I really, I think the, the best possible way to utilize this technology is not just using the data, but taking advantage of the fact that, especially with AccuLens, when you go over to the first lens fit and you select the lab that you want, so in this case, AccuLens, we're gonna select the Maxim 3D, which is their freeform design lens. As I mentioned, you can select a 15.9 or a 16.4 uh, diameter, and then you're you're basically you're just cl clicking calculate, and it's gonna it's gonna give you, based on the diameter you selected, the best um, trial lens or the best lens to put on the patient's eye out of the trial set. And the reason that this is really helpful is so now you can basically take this data, you can walk to the exam room, you can you can choose, in this case, the 7.5 base curve, the 15.9 diameter lens, and put it on the patient, and you're gonna get an over-refraction, which basically serves as a preview of, one, what the lens is essentially gonna feel like for the patient. Two, it gives them a preview of how good their vision's gonna be. Three, if it's a brand new patient to sclerals, it's gonna let you know if they're gonna really struggle with insertion and removal by just the act of you putting the lens in. So you can kind of see maybe how long you may need to schedule them for, for that type of training. But also the other big thing is the one thing that the maps, the eaglet maps don't do, they don't tell you how squishy the conjunctiva is. So even though they can very accurately tell you the shape of the eye um, with all of the profilometry data, um, 
we don't know exactly how much the lens is going to settle. And so, you know, those of us that have been fitting a lot of scleral lenses know that some people have really, you know, rock hard conjunctivas and other people, it's, it's just like a total sponge. And so you may see a map like this and say, gosh, that lens is going to be super duper flat when I put it on the eye. And then if this patient happens to have a really spongy conjunctiva, um, it may not be quite as off as you may think. And so having that, that other, you know, data that you yourself, the practitioner has now visualized, it's really helpful to send that information. There's a comment box when you actually use the, uh, AccuLens Direct Connect, which is how the data goes to the lab. Um, and in the comment box, you can, you can make comments and say, you know, the, the map looks really accurate. I agree with these numbers. Or, you know, I actually don't think we need a toric or a freeform map because everything kind of settled in and everything looks pretty good. So that's really good information for the lab to know. So, you know, there's that kind of human factor involved as well. So um, I guess... Tr Troy, do you want to kind of take over for a minute and see what, uh, show everyone what this looks like on the back end? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Giberman. Um, I guess we'll start off at the point to where um, uh, Alex has set us up. Let's see here. To where when he puts in, uh, uh, and selects a good scan, he sends it off through Direct Connect. And so what I'll show you is exactly what we see on our end. So what comes to us? It comes into our system in the form of an email. In the email, all the information that you input in the Direct Connect uh, form that you fill out uh, comes to us uh, exactly the same as what you filled out. Uh, also attached is the um, MSR file. Uh, that file is exactly what you see when you take the scan. It's all the same data. Yeah. <clears throat> what we can do with that is, is two things. First, we can import that directly into the CAD system. Uh, we do that periodically, depending on how many um, good scans we get. If we get a scan that's, uh, that's shallow in one area, we'll, we'll then analyze all the other data separately. So from that point, what we do, once we've downloaded that information into our system, it gives us the opportunity uh, to design a lens. Now with uh, Maxim 3D, it's a freeform design, and that freeform design uh, has an algorithm in it that takes into consideration the amount of sponginess that uh, Dr. Gibberman had mentioned. So typically, we're not going to design a lens that's exactly to um, the shape of the scan because we understand that the tissue compliance is going to play a part. So what we do is we typically will reduce the amount uh, of that algorithm by anywhere from between 100 to 200 microns. Uh, so to his point, uh, when you put a trial lens on, it's important to understand the compliance of the tissue. With that information sent back to us when you put it in the notes, it helps us make a decision on how much free form we need to put into the lens. So once we've transferred the information into the CAD system, it gives us the ability to uh, create a lens design that has the algorithm built in. And we input the information based off of the, the scan itself, the high and low points. So when we analyze the design, we get an opportunity to determine exactly at, at what axis we need to rotate the position uh, this lens design was based off of the one that Alex had presented. So you can see as we're rotating this, the deflection of the curve in the lens design will mimic the scan itself. Um, plus or minus 100 microns. So when you put the lens on the patient, the patient has the, the, the compliance in the tissue, allowing the lens to take form on the eye. So the software that we have is, is um, it's a 3D CAD system. Uh, all the information is in the background. Once we, once we put the information in the foreground here, lens design, uh, specifications of the material, et cetera, um, we can go in and we can actually bring in the design from our MSR file. So what this does is is a direct download of that cornea. 
So for this patient, once we drop that in and adopt it, you can see this white line within the two dimension cross section of the lens profile and the corneal profile. In the system, we're allowed to rotate that lens on center axis. As you can see, the shape of the overall scan is noticed in this two dimension. Now, as we rotate that, you see that there's a gap between the lens and the profile of the sclera and the cornea. What we do at that point is we take measurements and we change the overall profile of the lens using the algorithm. And we can do that on eight meridians individually. So once that's completed, the lens design then will mimic the scan that was sent to us. One important thing uh, that Alex did bring up is it's extremely important and it'll reduce chair time if you, you um, uh, do a trial fit. And the reason you're doing a trial fit is, is so important. Um, percentage right now is about a 78% success rate first time fit uh, with trial lens um, utilized in this process. If you uh, make the decision to not use a trial lens, it does reduce your first time success. So combination of both is a huge, huge benefit. No question about it. No, yeah. Actually, a lot of the, the changes that we end up making are not necessarily with the fit, but maybe refractive, you know? So the fit's usually pretty good. It's the, if, you know, maybe someone did monovision or multifocal or they need a little bit more added plus, a lot of those are the changes, you know, much easier to make those types of changes than, uh, you know, going back and, and tweaking the fit, but definitely cuts down on remakes to put a lens on the eye. Yeah, we, we, we really, want to stress to use the system, uh, use it to your advantage. In the first lens fit, it's important to make sure that uh, you let the system calculate that for you. It's going to reduce the chair time. It's going to make it more successful because it's a very close. Uh, once you've done that, <clears throat> you can analyze information based off of the trial fit and compare it to what you've seen. Uh, in the results section, what we do, we'll, we'll look at it the same way you do. We, we take a look at the SIM case and we determine that as our base point. We also look at uh, cord length. Now, when we design a lens, even though it's free form and we've, we've imported the data directly into the CAD system, we let the system calculate for us what a specific cord length uh, min and max sag should be. And we just simply type in a cord length. We go back to the design in the two, two dimensional cross section. And we take measurements to make sure that our min sag and our max sag match up at a cord length of 14 millimeter. The reason we choose 14 millimeters because in most cases, that's first contact point of the landing haptic of the two lens designs that we have in the 16.4 and 15.9. And to, to Alex's point, we we don't simply just design a lens based off of those two, two diameters. Everything is 100% customized. We see an increase in, in limbal clearance and we need to have limbal clearance increase. We'll increase the optical zone and lens diameter to match or vice versa. On a smaller cornea, we will decrease the lens diameter. So uh, the information that comes here, if we have to do that, or reduce cord length to what we see on the scan as first point of contact. And then again, take measurement in both min and max sag on the lens design. Rotating this into position also gives you an, an idea of where the axis is gonna be. When we design the lens, in this case, uh, what we're doing is creating, uh, in essence, a simple, um, uh, torque peripheral curve design. But it just so happens that uh, this is misaligned, typically what you would normally see in a with or rule. We can rotate that freeform design to any position. The benefit to that is the back surface of the lens will then conform to the fit of the eye. So if you have an offset multifocal or you have a front torque that needs to be put on the lens, that alignment will be more precise each time. 
Well, hey, uh, Troy, while you have that image up, you may also want to point out, you know, we were talking about good scans. And, and one of the ways that, you know, if you, if you haven't seen a lot of these, you may wonder how, how do you know if it's a good scan? And there's actually a couple different ways to do it. So, um, yeah, go ahead. So this is. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah. A good scan. There's, a, there's several things to look at, to take note of. Uh, first, go, go to your uh, results screen, and you can do this rather quickly. Uh, select source. Uh, if this is a blurry image, more than likely the scan isn't going to be accurate. You need a good reflection. Secondary to that, make sure that your, uh, your alignment uh, pins are matched up with the reflection off of the eye. The second thing to look at is the grid pattern. It's important that this grid pattern show a, a, um, a nice, uniform, bright picture. You need to be able to see these, these grid patterns in order to determine whether or not uh, you have enough fluid on the eye and you're getting a good reflection. Now, secondary to that, uh, in, in, in kind of uh, tandem, is tangent angles. The tangent angles, uh, a good indicator of a dry eye, a dry surface, is if there's striation lines through this uh, profile. Striation lines also indicate uh, uh, excessive dryness. So you're not going to get a good image bouncing back and um, your overall scan isn't going to be as accurate as it should be. And I, I would add that the other, um, the other point here is, you know, if you're using it, let's say you wanna use a slightly bigger lens, a 16.4 or bigger, um, you wanna make sure that you have enough data uh, peripherally to do that. So, you know, you may have a great um, central image or you may have a great image in two quadrants, but, you know, you may have two full quadrants missing data that goes out far enough. And you can very easily check that as a good, kind of a good example here, actually, where, you know, that horizontal meridian has a lot of data and then up in that um, superior nasal, superior temporal, right? So that, you know, that's a, a great example of a not so good, not so good image. Um, and, you know, that, ha you know, whether a patient has tight lids or they, you know, have a lot of, it's pretty slick, you let go of the, the lid, that's, that's kind of how that happens. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, if you send that to the, the lab, you're, you're going to be missing quite a, quite a bit. Um, and you can actually use the cursor of your mouse and just hold it right over the top of the image. And it will tell you exactly how many millimeters uh, you have. Um, so yeah, it says 5.99. Well, if that's your radius and you double it, you really only have data for a 12 millimeter lens. I mean, that's, you know, that's not even really going to cut it for a, a, you know, a soft lens in, in that case. So, you know, that's, uh, you're, you're asking the lab to extrapolate quite a bit of data if you, if you send that image in. So yeah, one, this particular patient, um, we have multiple images, uh, for this patient. And it was a struggle for this patient because the lids were extremely tight. The fissure was extremely narrow. Um, they finally did get a good image, but it really pays to take a little more time on these difficult patients. Uh, take as many images as you can if you start to struggle. Um, more data, the better. Um, and when you do, don't just send us one image. We would like to have three or four images that you feel that are worthy uh, of analyzing. Uh, that helps us. It's always possible you send one image that gives us a good amount of data on the horizontal, and then the next image gives us a little more data on the vertical. Uh, that always helps us. We can always extrapolate the data. We'll import both of these into the system, uh, rotate those on axis, and determine if we can get highs and lows based off of the information uh, coming in. So. Take as many images as you, you feel are necessary, depending on the patient and the difficulty of it. And I will admit there are plenty of, there are times where, you, you know, you just simply, you know, the, those patients that have those really kind of deep set eyes and prominent bones, I mean, you know, if you can't get a good image, it's sometimes better to just put a lens on the eye instead. You know, we may try and still use it just to get an idea of HVID and VVID and things like that, but you know, we may not end up sending the, the image to the lab at all in, in some of those cases. So it's just good to pay attention to. Just because you took an image doesn't mean it's, it's you know, 
going to help out a lot, you know, if you, if you don't have enough data. And don't be, don't be afraid to, if you can't get a good image, and this is the best image you can achieve, don't be afraid to let the system calculate a first lens trial fit and put it on the eye. Um, that data is going to be even more important in cases like this. Uh, additional to that, even though this, this patient has a HVID that's well over 12 millimeter, uh, don't, don't struggle with trying to uh, put a 16-4 trial lens on. Put the 15-9 trial lens as, as we're describing here and, and give us the feedback on the actual fit in, in any other struggles you may have. So, you know, I guess the other thing, kind of going back to some of the stuff you were showing us in the CAD CAM software, and I think that's such an awesome thing about, you know, how AccuLens approaches this, you know, some, I, you know, and I definitely understand that, you know, some of the, you know, practitioners out there have more of an engineer's brain and, you, you know, some, some of these, uh, you know, some of you folks love just, you know, having absolute control over every little thing and, you know, the, the eaglet still lets you do that. You can very much use it to design. Um, but at least for me, and I certainly think it's very important to understand and where the numbers are coming from and what's going on behind the scenes at, at the lab. So it, it's nice to play around with all the information and look at the numbers and really get a good grasp on it. But at the end of the day, the thing that really saves time and the, the thing that I love so much about eaglet and Aculum specifically is really the fact that I don't have to do all of that. I'm not the one that's, that's really rearranging all the peripheral curves and the profile. It's just simply me looking at it getting a good idea of what trial lens to use and then submitting the data and then being done with it. And then, you know, <laughs> you know, the guys at AccuLens are really the ones that are doing all of the, the hard work there. And that's awesome because it just saves a lot of time. Um, and it's, it's not always, uh, you know, like that with everyone, but I, that's just one of the things I really love about how simple it is. You, you get a good image, you submit it, you put a trial lens on, um, you use that to supplement it and then you're good to go. Yeah, yeah, the, let, the, let the technology, you know, take you to the next step, really. Um, all this information that you see and all, and all these, this 3D model, that's, that comes directly from the scan itself. Uh, you, we wouldn't know exactly where to put a, a notch, a, a microvolt. You wouldn't know exactly where to put that unless you had the scan done. And a good a good indicator of that here is is that on this particular design, uh, these blue points indicate this steeper uh, um, haptic, uh, and this area indicates exactly where that um, microvolt is. Well, that microvolt is exactly at the right position based off of the scan taken, and that can be rotated anywhere along the 360 degrees. So if the scan comes back and it says that it's a 184 degrees, we'll put the center of that based off of the scan. A, a much easier process than trying to determine where to put a notch for a penguecula uh, with a magic marker on the patient's eye. No question. Um, do you have the, uh, the scan for the, the other patient? Because that would be, I'm speaking of, uh, you know, micro or AccuVault. Um, as AccuLens uh, calls their vault system. Um, you know, we had another example. One of my patients was a 88-year-old uh, guy, super sharp. Um, he had RK, um, so his eyes were already kind of messed up a little bit. But um, and then even before that, he was a, a high imitrope. So who knows what his vision was, was really like. Um, to make matters worse, he got an infection somewhere along the line in his right eye and developed a little scar uh, to make his astigmatism even a little bit more irregular. Um, he was a diabetic, he developed neuropathy, so he had all sorts of stuff going on. And despite all of that, still able to achieve about 20, 40 plus in his right eye and 20, 30 in his left. So um, he was really, really happy. But um, yeah, this is a good example of, you know, that, that little red uh, where the blue circle uh, is over that red spot is, is a pinguecula. And um, basically, the software allows you, and, or it allows, in this case, the lab, to measure not only the precise location of it, but exactly 
how high it is, how deep it is, and then they can customize the vault to basically go right over top of it. So it's really, really nice. You're no longer guessing uh, to, to Troy's point, you're not putting a magic marker on the spot and sending it back to the lab. Um, you're, you're simply sending this um, image and, and letting them do the, letting them do their magic. Uh, you know, one, one point on that is that this particular patient uh, of Dr. Gibberman's is um, this, uh, this area that we need to put in a, an AccuVault, I can go uh, select exactly at the, what axis, it's a seven degrees, as you can see within the little window. And then I also am noticing that it starts right at the limbus and extends all the way out. So when we put in a micro vault, we're not simply just putting in a simple uh, notch that goes maybe three millimeter in. We can actually measure that and take that micro vault further in and, and start it gradually until it, it, it's all the way out to the edge. Which is great because this guy had a pterygium, which normally you know would have created all sorts of uh, issues even if not right at the edge, closer to the, um, you know, the limbus, as, as Troy mentioned. So it's just really nice to be able to customize the lenses that much. Because ultimately it helps the lenses center better. They're, the eyes getting less red, you know, it, and obviously a better centered lens, better vision. Um, but certainly if they're in a multifocal, that's advantageous. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really good advantages to, to having that. So I think that, uh, does anybody, do we have any questions out there? I, I have a question. This is Gloria Chu. Um, hey. Is there a way to quantify um, objectively the amount of tericity seen on these very detailed images? Like, can you say there's, like, how would you describe this tericity if you're trying to type it? Like, is there a way to do that? Or is it so detailed with this image that there's, you can't there's actually it? There's actually a couple ways to do that. Um, you can really make it, you know, on that, that biosphere elevation map, which I was, you know, it's kind of that, that home screen. Um, you know, when you go down there where under sagittal height, where it says cord length, you know, if you type in the cord length that you want, that's basically where you're going to be getting all of your data. So, you know, if you wanted to see it right at the limbus for, you know, to, you know, check tericity there, you, you know, maybe you're using 13, uh, 14 millimeters, so to speak, because I know, you know, Aculent, where they're, the way their design works, they kind of prefer 14. Uh, but really, you can put whatever number you want in there, and then you can either use the, the data in that column to give you um, I think probably the most useful one just to estimate touristy would be that 90 min, 90 max sag because it's basically giving you principal meridians 90 degrees apart. And that 3.16 and 3.41 tells you that based on where that, that meridian is lined up right now, that you actually at least, and it's not exact, but it's, it's telling you at that point, um, you have about 250-ish microns of Toricity between the two principal meridians. If you wanted to try and get more specific, which is kind of actually what, what I think Troy and, and, and Aculens will do, is they'll actually just use the cursor um, and hold it directly over some of these areas and see where there it says negative 430 and you uh -huh. can move it around and you can get an idea just, you know, kind of floating it around those spots um, and you can record it in different you know, slightly different places, and you still then have an even better idea um, of exactly in that spot how much um, either above or below the best fit sphere um, that that area of the sclera is. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So, like, you can specify cord. So you could choose like at fourteen millimeters across exactly. or something. And then uh, that's going to give you all the data at that cord length. Just that specific point, though. So yeah, if you choose 14, and then you kind of click and unclick the, the checkbox up there. Um, I'm just thinking like, yeah. you know, when you order a scleral lens and you say like horizontal, I want to do like this, and then vertical is three steep from that or something like right. that. Yeah. Um, so. 
how so do you like like translate that like design to what you see here? Gotcha. So the first part is, um, you know, we and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Troy, but I think that AccuLens kind of assumes a settling of about 150 to 200 microns. Yeah, that's correct. That's that's on average. So to, to, to answer the question a little more precisely, uh, when we're designing the lens, we, we actually use the min sag and max sag and we take into con we take into an account account that the the min sag is at eight degrees and the max sag is at forty-two. So in this case, this is not this is more of a quadrant specific design or multi-quadrant uh, specific where you're joining two or three quadrants together to be steeper where the upper portion of the lens is a little bit flatter. So we make sure that when we're rotating the lens and we see the high and low of our, our landing haptic that we, we're making sure that it's closer to the, 80, the eight degree and 42 degree. If we, if we look at the numbers at um, the, the 90 degree uh, min and max, they're slightly different. In and most where cases- is that exactly? Like they're 90 degree when you say that, like where is it on the chart? It's, it's pretty much wherever you move the, the, um, the meridian. Okay. All right. Sorry. I know I have really technical questions. So no, I that's it. No so like, if, if, you, yeah, if, <laughs> if you leave the meridian um, where oh, this is good. There, it's basically just using that and then 90 degrees yeah. away from that. So here, uh, so, so simply put right here, uh, it, the min sag is at nine degrees. 90 degrees from that is max sag. Down here, the data is a little bit different because it's giving you min sag is setting at eight degrees and max sag is setting at 42 degrees. Now, if I go and change this um, cord length to 13 millimeter, that will slightly change. So as I bring it in further, uh, I'll bring it in closer to the limbus, I see what the difference is. The touristy then, will be less. Correct, and that's exactly yeah. what happens. But keep in mind, like he said, uh, what we do is we uh, uh, take into consideration the, uh, the pliability of the tissue, which uh, normally is about 150 microns. So we'll automatically subtract that. And then whatever tericity is left over, that's what we start to target on, on the base design. Right. So if, if, there, if there was, like in this case, a difference of 250 microns, um, you, you wouldn't, you know, let's say you didn't put a lens on the eye and you the data and the, the lab wouldn't design a lens with 250 microns of, of uh, you know, touristy. They would really, it would be, if anything, it would be closer to 100. Correct. Yeah, uh, keep in mind, these, these scans are, are, they don't, the scans themselves don't have the knowledge that there's the compliance in the tissue. The tissue soft uh, for one patient compared to another. Uh, these scans are as if, if it were a, a solid bowling ball. Uh, that's basically what we're looking at. So we have to take those things into consideration when we put a final design together. And, and Gloria, I guess the last thing I would say is that's, you know, in this, in this instance, you know, I think if you're kind of used to the, I guess it's the Zen system, right? Where they use like the, you know, three or three steep, four flat or whatever. Right. And they've kind of quantified that as well, each, each step, so to speak, is uh, I a number of microns. Right. So, you know, in, in, the, uh, in, in the good old days, so to speak, right, when we were just using trial set, I mean, we kind of established with Aculens, like, you know, one step, I think we would roughly say was about 125 microns or so. So if we were saying, you know, we're going to steepen this quadrant one step, that's kind of what we would use. Or you could say, I want to do a half step. Um, so we would kind of go in, in half steps, so to speak of, you know, 75 to 100 microns each. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, if you want to think of it in those terms, if, you know, cause I still, I will still, you know, when I put a trial lens on and I, I leave comments in the comment box, you know, that's kind of how I will, you know, the, the lens speak that I'll use in this case is I'll say, yeah, you know, I agree with the map, but based on the, you know, what the lens looks like, um, you know, in that super, you know, steep meridian uh, there at kind of seven o'clock, 
um, I would say, yeah, I, you know, I would agree, you know, maybe two steps of, of steepening makes sense or something like that. Cause then it's, you know, maybe it's a 200 microns or so. Um, so. Yeah. And for, for, for the, for yeah. us, we're going to make the, yeah. we're going to, we're going to make the assumption that uh, we're going to reduce this. This right now is telling us it's a uh, 540 microns. We're going to automatically. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, we have oh, a ahead. few other questions, and I, I just want to say one thing, uh, particularly to uh, to uh, Gloria Chu or or to anyone listening here, is that uh, during the um, the online trainings, uh, we have one on one Zoom sessions, where we really take time to to dig in uh, uh, as deep as the as the practitioner wants into um, in into the uh, the material. And, and so we really uh, spend a lot of time one on one to explain all of these uh, these situations. So um, uh, all of that will be will be covered during the during the, the training um, session. Um, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, one is um, or actually three more questions. OK, so this is from. Um, uh, Dr. Nguyen, and and she asks, uh, well, she, she gives a compliment. This technology is really uh, uh, an incredibly impressive. Thank you for the compliment. Um, but how does this compare to something like iPrint Pro? Well, uh, for starters, um, you know, it's not a mold, right? So no, no goop involved. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, Similar, but it's, uh, it's different. You know, iPrint Pro, and I, I, I'm not going to speak from experience because I, I don't currently use it. But, you know, what's, with the freeform lenses, you can do a lot of stuff with sclerals that you didn't used to, you know, as far as getting really detailed. Where I think iPrint, you know, you know has the edges for the really totally crazy stuff that, that just... The, the traditional, even the, not since say traditional, but the new lathe cutting technology doesn't quite handle, you know, when you've got maybe a, a very significant uh, glaucoma tube or shunt or something like that, um, or some, you know, really kind of uh, whatever it may be going on um, that just a traditional, even freeform lens design can't, can't handle or can't cut. Maybe the vaults can't go quite that high there's, to me, there's just some specialty situations where, um, you know, for really off the wall stuff where, where the uh, eye print um, can, can do that using the mold. But um, with, with the freeform designs, and in this case, you know, the Maxim 3D, I mean, they can really, there's a, a huge range of, uh, of conditions that we can kind of deal with a lot better that we, we couldn't in the past. And, and a good example of that, I think, would be patients that have had EOM surgery where there's just some really crazy differences, um, you know, nasal, temporal, superior, inferior, you know, where they've had rectus um, stuff done. And, um, you know, we've, we've, I had patients that I fit six years ago and they kind of failed out of a scleral and we refit them with the freeform designs and they were able to do it. So um, kind of a long-winded answer there, but I, I think that's, you know, One's a mold and one's not. That's the, the main one. Awesome, thank you. A second question that she uh, she asked is, um, so when you scan um, the eye uh, with fluorescein, how can you ensure that your lifting of the patient's lids is not inducing toricity of the sclera uh, by compressing by the, by the fingers? Um, well, uh, the one hand is if, you know, that's why I think it's a good idea for you, the practitioner to be involved in the beginning, because you obviously are going to know if you've got, you, you know, if you've got the lid by the, you know, by the lasses and really kind of, um, pushing it on, on the bone versus on the eye, you know, so once you have a good feel for that, it's easier to teach a staff member how to do that properly. Just kind of show them, hey, look, this is what it feels like when you're pushing on the eye, and this is what it feels like when you're not. Um, and then number two is that, you know, the actual scans, uh, a lot of times you'll just, you know, maybe, and this is why I think it's also good to take three of them. If you have one scan where you have a huge area of, uh, you know, blue compression, 
and the other two you don't, that's that's usually a good indicator that there was some uh, compression there. And I would I would argue that that's another reason why it's good to put a lens on the eye, because if your if your um, trial set lens that you put on the eye doesn't agree at all with your image, then likely something went awry with the image. Awesome, thank you. And uh, we have one question from uh, Dr. G. Giorgio, and this is actually uh, directed at Troy. Um, and he says that if you have uh, a more highly toric cornea, will the transition zone of the Maxim lens be toric design? Uh, say, for example, uh, a cornea with uh, more than 150 to 200 microns of difference at, uh, at about 13 millimeter cord. Um, is, is it there? Is the maximum design, does it all, all already allow there at, at the 13 millimeter zone uh, a toric design? Uh, it does. Uh, as a matter of fact, on all uh, Maxim 3D designs, the toricity or quad specific starts right after the optical zone. So an example being if you have a, a 15.9 diameter, that optical zone is 8.5. So everything outside that optical zone is going to be freeform. Yep. Wonderful. Um, I hope that uh, that answers everyone's questions. If uh, if you if, if anyone has a question, then this is the time to, uh, to ask it uh, via the chat if you can. Um, but I believe we've we've covered most. And thank you for all the people asking questions. Always uh, uh, helps and, and, and brings out more. Uh, just a, a quick note from us um, to how to contact us and where to find out more. Uh, it's it's about at eagledye.com and scrollfitting.com and also at uh, at acculens.com. Um, there's um, info at eagledye.com and info at acculens.com. Uh, this is specific um, contact information from uh, from Acculens as well for the Maxim 3D. And um, so you see the the telephone number here. And, and again, the, uh, the, the email address. And, um, and with that, um, we, uh, we thank our guest speakers, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gimmerman and, uh, and Troy Miller uh, warmly for uh, presenting uh, the Maxim 3D and the connection with the Eye Surface Profiler. And from us at Eaglet Eye, it's, uh, it's a thank you. And uh, please tune in for one of the next Direct Connect uh, webinars. Uh, where we hope to see you very soon. Um, so from all of us, thank you so much and uh, see you next thank time. Thank you. Thanks, guys.